create a workshop to arrive at an agreement of how the team wants to work. What are the rules of play? What are the boundaries within which the team can self-organize? Because self-organization, it's not anarchy. Self-organization is like self-management within the boundaries that we set. Hi, I'm Maria, and this is the Agile State of Mind. Welcome! Today, I would like to talk about the rules of play. Does your team have any rules of play? Do they have any agreement that can lead them through the process? Today, I will show you not only what are the agreements for and why we should have them, but also how to collaboratively work on them with your team and how to keep them updated. First, I'll show you a template I created in FigGem to brainstorm their working agreements with your team. Then I will show you two testimonials from my engineering manager's interviews about using the team agreements in practice. Diana Reichel will explain how her team updates the agreements after each retro and how she reminds the team about them. And Miguel Angel Gomez will explain how he created the agreements with his new team. Having agreements can lead us to having high-performing teams and ultimately that leads to building great products that delight our customers. And that's the ultimate goal of every team and every company. So let's see how to do that. Let's start. Working agreement is a list of points that the team agrees upon when it comes to the collaboration, the processes they will follow, the tools they will use, and so on. For that, I actually created something in FigGem and that will help you understand how that works in practice. I like to use the opportunity to create team agreements as a team building activity because at the end, it can be really fun and it can be used as bonding for the team because everybody has a say of what should be the rules of play of the team and everybody feels empowered and equally important in the team. So that's a great thing to do to so come together and collaboratively brainstorm what should be the agreements we want to fall on. I created a template. I will show you right now when I share the screen. For that, if you need remote, I like to use a digital wildboard wild board i just can't say this word and this time i used figma's fig gem not sure if you're familiar with that fact that if your company has figma license it has also a fig gem access and fig gem is very similar in functionality to miro or mural it's great to use it for collaboration what's more in fig gem if you click on share you can actually start an open session where everybody who doesn't normally has a, an account and license can use that access for 24 hours. Then it expires. But it's great because typically we would use these kind of tools just for a collaborative session and workshop. And after that, we go and default to our lovely Confluence or wherever you put your documents. So I created here a template for working agreements. It can serve as a basis. Where do we start? I created some categories because it's easier for the team to think on given topics than to just think like, oh my God, let's start with the agreements. What do we want to agree upon? I have no idea. So first one is working hours. A typical agreement could be that we define that the time between the daily standup, that is 10 a.m. and in the other agreements, we can agree on the times of all our meeting, that between that time and let's say the lunch, that's 1 p.m., we have a space for meetings. So everybody can expect that at, mostly at that time, we will try to fit the meetings so the rest of the day can be focus time. That's just an example. Then we have another category and that's the meetings. So the daily, the refinement, the punctuality about recording the meetings. So any agreement that you would like to have with the team about the meeting. Some of them can be just that we start the daily at 10 a.m. and we don't wait for everybody to join because everybody should be there at 10 a.m. sharp or we wait two minutes. That is up to the team. I live through different ways of punctuality on the meetings. And what I like to do, as you see, I leave the space for the post-it. Usually I would go to the 
with the template without any post-its in it for the team to come up with what they think. And then we all agree. Third category is estimation. Do we estimate? If we estimate, what is it that we estimate and who estimates? Because I have also found teams that not everybody estimates. Is that okay? Do we want that? Do we want to have like an ultimate goal that the whole team can estimate even though they are not experts in one of the fields? But maybe that makes sense because then everybody pays attention. And of course, what do we use for those estimations? For example, in our team, we use the Slack plugin. Other categories, development practices. And then the next one is testing practices. So that can be anything. Probably on one session, we will not just close everything. Sometimes a different domains like front-end and back-end can have different agreements when it comes to development practices. It makes sense to have a guild for that domain and agree on more specific things. So here we should probably just limit ourselves to what is for the whole team. Maybe it's more about the workflow that the task goes through Jira. Then what about pair programming? Do we want to put some rules that we at least have one per programming session per person per week just to start the team on the per programming. Then we have probably done design system or design patterns that we use and just make sure that everybody's aware. Not all agreements have to be here. It can be just a link to some other agreements that we have. Then testing practices, the same. How do we test? Who tests? How do we report bugs and how do we do triage on the bugs? And last but not least, anything else, team processes, collaboration. Sometimes we have something like, let's have one meeting that will be where we meet and talk anything but work. That helps many teams to bond, especially if you never see each other in real life. So this is a template that I just set up in a few minutes. You can take it or leave it. It's very easy to copy, so feel free to copy it. What I would do is brainstorm in FigGem and then move on and start putting them in Confluence, wherever you put your documentation and put some colors on it so it's not the, the most boring document you could ever find. And then you can write the category, working hours, typical working hours, and we put our agreement, meeting slot, focus time, and so on. So this could be the output of what we agree in FigGem or any other whiteboard. And yeah, that's basically it. I used to work on team agreements with every team I was a part of. And recently I realized I stopped doing that. I had a short break with working very closely with the teams. And now that I came back to that, I forgot about the importance of the team agreements. But thanks to my podcast and the guests I invite, I got reminded about them. So I would like to show you a brief clip of Jana Reichel. And I did an interview with her about about the team lead role and she mentions the importance of team agreements and how they use them I would say effortlessly because they just update them after each retrospective let's see what Jana has to say about it you have like a set of team agreements written mm -hmm. and then on the retrospectives you just go there and change yeah. them if you see that it's needed we have a confluence page with uh, mm -hmm. retro action items and also team agreements I think it's totally okay and also normal to go out of a retrospective and just update your team agreements and and not really have super specific action items in terms of next sprint we're going to do this and that because the problems you are trying to solve are usually you know like yeah, human <laughs> we didn't talk enough we you know we forgot about this or that process or so yeah when the team doesn't stick to team agreements then we have i remind them of it in in team meetings like whether it's in in the daily or like other ceremony or i also um, remind them in one-on-one -on -one sessions whenever i see that thing things are not working what i'm also trying to do is again explaining why we have decided to stick to this agreement and say okay so in this situation we were you know doing this again like we used to do it but actually we had this team agreement to change this and that so that we can actually improve on this item and whenever you're not sticking to it then you can actually point out again the reason like why did we decide this as a team and it's not and it's also easier to remind the team of a team agreement than reminding the team of something that I, for example, want, right? So 
Usually what happens is that some people are just too shy to actually remind the team and then they are super happy that I'm the one pointing out, hey guys, you actually agreed on this and that in the last retrospective. I really like that. And I think I forgot about this. It's always so much easier to like fall back to an agreement that we made as a team, as opposed to just say, are you sure you want to do it this way? It's so much less direct, invasive, easier, right? right? It's not so invasive, yeah. So Jana, is talking about a team that already has team agreements and how they keep iterating on them and updating them. But we also have Miguel, who was talking about how he actually started a new team and how arriving at those agreements was important. What I did was creating a small plan of what I consider a team needs to be able to operate. When you're creating a team, it's important to have different things. First one and most important one is a purpose. Then after that, it's like, okay, how we operate, how we operate as a team. We want to have Scrum, Kanban. After that, you need to establish also some common practices of how we do things, like how we do our QA, how we deal with bugs, how we help the people when there is some challenge how we collaborate with each other, how often we want to have a retro, how we prioritize things. Let's try and review, try and review. And that's the first thing that you have to do to, to set up a team. So what they did was create a workshop to arrive at an agreement of how the team wants to work. What are the rules of play? What are the boundaries within which the team can self-organize? Because let's remember also, self-organization, it's not anarchy. Self-organization is like self-management within the boundaries that we set. Having those agreements is great also when you have a new joiner coming into a team. This way, they can get up to speed so much quicker because they can read the agreements, they can ask questions to them, and they can quickly familiarize themselves with any working habits of the team, collaboration practices, and also the culture of the team and ultimately the company. And I really like what I heard on the interviews I do for the engineering management podcast. What I see is that great leaders leave many decisions up for the team. Of course, everybody gives boundaries, but giving the decisions up to the team, even when it comes to what process will we use in the team? Do we use Scrum? Do we use Kanban? Or do we use some kind of a mix between Scrum and Kanban? Because that's what works, because that's also what people worked in previous companies. One more tip I will give you, it's never too late to start. Sometimes you will notice that we go to a retrospective and people don't really understand the processes or they forgot or we agreed about something three retrospectives ago and suddenly nobody remembers and they fall back to what they were doing most of their lives. So yeah, that's it. Very easy, very quick. How to on team agreements, working agreements, however we want to call them. I hope this will help you and inspire you. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. Thank you.